Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, February uh, edition of our uh, online talks with the Contemporary Group. Uh, this month, I'm delighted to say we've got Sarah Lee talking to us about her her work. Sarah is a very well respected and well known uh, photographer, and we'll be talking a little bit about her paid for work, if you like, the commissions that she gets, uh, and also the work uh, that she does for on, for herself, uh, and particularly the way she liked to talk about the way she developed her voice in photography. Now I'm going to start sharing uh, my screen right now, and if anybody has got any questions, we will take those, um, excuse me, we will take those uh, at the end, uh, or at, at appropriate points. I'm sorry, uh, during the the, the the session. So, um, really, this is. Uh, oh, come on, <laughs> that's it. Um, Sarah, to, this is the image that really got you going, wasn't it? I I, I loved the fact that it was a almost a chance con conversation you had with Eamon McCabe. So do you want to tell us a little uh, bit about this one? Yeah, I, firstly, thank you very much for having me. And it's I'm kind of slightly blown away by the honour and overwhelmed with imposter syndrome because I've seen the other people you've had talking before me. Um, so, I mean, I thought, as you mentioned in your introduction, that I would talk about my career because photography is a love and a vocation but it is also my job and those things intersect and you know it's, it's about pictures and trying to find a voice um which is an ongoing process I'm, i've only been at it 20 years and i'm hoping probably more decades um i started off i didn't study photography um for better and for worse in some cases i, I studied literature and i whilst i was at university that was really when i got into photography and i worked for the student newspaper so not because I was interested in photojournalism at the time but because they gave you free film and access to a dark room and they taught you to print and I had no money and developing film um, was really expensive so but through that it was like I did a sort of parallel um, degree really sort of photography and my English degree sort of ran in tandem now, whilst I was doing my literature degree, I started working part time as a researcher for a biographer who was writing a biography of Iris Murdoch. Um, and this was in the late 90s. And towards I think this must have been taken in about 1998 uh, when I'd been serious about photography for about two years. Um, and it's the only time I met Murdoch and she would just announced that she had Alzheimer's, but she was still doing public appearances. Her, it hadn't, her Alzheimer's hadn't developed to the point where she couldn't talk in public, although she'd announced it. So the public were very aware of it and there was a lot of interest. And I asked her biographer you know, if it would be all right if I took a portrait and he was very cautious about me not wanting to um, be exploitative, but he trusted me. And she and her husband, John Bailey, the academic, were really gracious and said yes. And she was walking around the grounds of a, I think it was a hotel in Bath where she was giving a lecture. Um, and I was so nervous, I mis I shot the film, it was 400 ASA film, but I exposed it at 200 ASA and then had to print it myself and was terrified that I would screw it up, but I loved that portrait. And I entered the Guardian Student Media Awards um, that year, and they were very strict then, I think they've loosened it up a bit now, but you could only enter pictures that had been in your student paper, so this wasn't one of them. And I didn't win, a very good friend of mine won, but I came second. Um, and Eamon McCabe was the judge and he was the then Guardian picture editor. And he said, well, why don't you come and show me your portfolio? Um, and I, to be honest, I didn't know what a portfolio was. I certainly didn't have one, but I said, well, I can bring in some pictures and I brought in some of the things I'd printed. And he saw this and it really stopped him in his tracks because he said, well, how did you get to photograph her? And I explained, and he said that his favorite job of that year was a portrait of Iris Murdoch and it must have just caught his eye. And he said, why don't you start next Tuesday, come in two days a week and we'll see what happens. And that was 21 years ago at the Guardian. I'm still there, I sort of dug in. Anyway, that's it, but it's very rare, I think in life and in photography that there's a moment where your life pivots and changes direction. I hadn't 
considered that I would ever, I mean, it never occurred to me that I could earn my living as a photographer. I loved it, but I didn't have the confidence. And I certainly wouldn't have had the confidence to pursue it as a profession. Um, and I, it's, I mean, it's uh, obviously it's so hard to get into photography. I'm aware it sounds a bit vomit inducing that a job at the Guardian fell on my lap like that. But yeah, this photograph was a kind of real pivot. You know, my life completely changed absolutely when I took this picture. So anyway, that's why I wanted to start with it. I hope, forgive me. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Now, we talked about commissions and work that you wanted to do. Uh, the next set of images are surrounding the the uh, the BAFTA skull behind the curtain, uh, and uh, I sort of love this 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 image. To I'm glad you do, just very quickly. I love that image. I don't think I'm not a hundred percent certain BAFTA loves that image, but I'm afraid I'm, I have a very soft spot for it. That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> it's the enthusiasm of the the crowd which i'm just as interested in as i am in the celebrity and the yeah you know, the kind of hollywood aspect of it i mean i love that interaction um and the, it's, a, it's a bit it, the first time i heard it it, it sounded like a sort of well-mannered prison riot it, the sort of <laughs> there are people who queue up overnight to get those spaces at the front of the barriers and actually the more years you do it you see the same faces over and over again it's obviously it's their thing that they you know do this kind of extreme autograph hunting um but i yeah I, I love the energy that comes off it and he how could i resist his face <laughs> he's extraordinary <laughs> it, a, a more elegant face yeah um I, I mean it's interesting these are from the television baftas which are slightly different visually because they are in may um on the south bank at the festival hall as opposed to the albert hall or the royal opera house in february when it's very dark so the red carpet here you actually have natural light helping you um but yes uh, i mean i have a it happened about six years ago um i got invited to come and it was a dream of a commission shoot however i liked a kind of roaming essay and BAFTA had a you know, really enlightened and lovely head of photography then, and who's actually been replaced by someone equally enlightened. Um, Jeanette Daly was who first got me in and you know, said, shoot how you like, colour, black and white, I don't mind. You know, come back with something and you, know, you very rarely get that. Um, and I usually work in colour, but I decided to work in black and white because there's so much else going on at an awards ceremony, branding, um, it's slightly, I think, to the irritation of the sponsors that I never get any of the branding in. You know, I like personality and I wanted something that was intimate. And I thought black and white works with that. And I was going to say it has a nod to old Hollywood, but I'm not sure Grayson Perry particularly nods to old Hollywood here. But I couldn't resist, again, the interaction with the audience. Um, and BAFTA had been great. They let me go access all areas wherever I like. And I like to be quite low key. I shoot it all on my Leicas and... I have to wear black tie as well. And I have to say I wore heels one year and that was a hideous error. And so black tie, but with a flat shoe. And I'm trying to do an ongoing essay about kind of intimate moments in a very public event. Um, like the, gosh, I love this one. This was on the red carpet. And those are kind of Leonardo Caprio's security and they were pushing him through a crowded thong and I was walking backwards and because I was focusing, I think I shot that on a 50 mil, but it's a manual focus with quite a narrow depth of field. So I nearly went flying backwards. And for a second, DiCaprio saw me about to fall and I think it amused him. I didn't fall and I nailed the focus. So it was win-win anyway. Um, yeah, again, it's, I, I mean, I'm trying to create a kind of ongoing body of work with this and I'm only there by invitation every year. So I'm, I may have done my last one and I hope not, but um, the, you know, John Boyega, the double camera, it, as I say, I find the fans and there seems to be a thing of, it was autographs and now it's selfies with the star. And I, that's ch changed from autographs to the selfies in the last six years that I've been doing it. And it strikes me the more I do it, it's like a, a comment on modern, it, it, it's like a the person holding the camera wants a selfie so they can say, you know, I too was here, or it's a sort of a benediction from the famous person. You know, they have touched me for this moment. I too was with them. And I, it's got an incredible energy. And because the stars are there 
you know, because they're hoping to win awards. You know, it, it's very good natured, which I think some instances of interaction between members of the public and celebrities aren't always that good natured. Um, yeah, and it, you can't, behind me in this shot, there are hundreds of camera crews, other people on the red carpet. I, I don't know if I've really given the sense of the, the crowd of it. I mean, there's a lot of noise and a lot of crowd and everyone's shouting from one set of barriers and you know, shouting the stars' names to try and get them to cross sides of the red carpet. It is like a well-organized starry prison riot. Um, yeah, this is my favorite bit. When you, there's a bit after the red carpet where there are hundreds of photographers and all the world's camera crews and there's all this noise. I mean, I keep talking about prison riots. I've never been in a prison riot, so I don't imagine they are anything like that. Then you, there's normally two or three of us that are photographers, that is, that are allowed into the auditorium. And there's about 20 minutes where the stars are all taking their seats. But they're so pleased to be out of the glare of the press and they're so excited. Yeah, you know, there are stars that have worked together on previous projects. It has the kind of air of a, I don't know, a school bus or a school trip or something. People are so excited and the tannoy is saying, you know, ladies and gentlemen, will you please take your seats? And they all ignore it until the very last minute. And if you're a photographer who quite likes lurking and watching things, it's just a joy. You'll turn around and there's Joanna Lumley catching up with Joan Collins. I mean, it's a sort of, it's a bit like shooting fish in a barrel in terms of getting images. It's the, the really the, the privilege of it is having the access to that um, because there are interesting moments and I really like this one. It's quite, um, yeah, this was shot in the wings, another bit where the access is something that really counts. And, and I, I hope I'm not boring people, but I, I've, Every photographer, as far as I can tell, you know, has a different ways of approaching images and their work. Um, and there are some photographers who are very, you know, people respond to their charisma and bow down before it. And I don't think I'm that kind of photographer. I like to quietly watch and sometimes there'll be eye contact and an engagement, but I like to be almost invisible if I can be. And in this instance, I was invisible because um, Maisie Winston Williams put it on her Instagram and said, I have no idea who took this. I didn't see anyone there. And I was, she was about to, we were in the wings and she was about to walk on stage and present an award. So that's the, what's known as the citation in her envelope. And she was murmuring her lines to herself. You know, she had a short, you know, this year, the best actress, you know, whatever, sort of, she had a, a spiel and she was memorizing it and murmuring it. And I was lurking right in the darkness and it was just such a nice moment. And she looked so vulnerable, actually, um, sort of touchingly vulnerable. It does, doesn't she? Yeah. Well, it was annoying. She posted it to her 20 million followers with no credit, but that's because she didn't notice I was there. So, <laughs> well. Now, that was, those were uh, commissioned photographs and albeit you've got uh, lots of freedom to, to, to run, it would seem. But I wanted to look at this series that you sent me, uh, Tender as the Nighthawks, which I thought was fascinating. What's the background to this one? Um, well, I mean, she, I'll tie it into BAFTA. It would be, forgive me talking a little bit. Um, I, I think we said on the phone and talking about how a career works. And I started my career very much because it fell in my lap and I didn't really know what to do. I didn't have a plan as such. And it's very much about the commissions you get. And I don't just work for The Guardian. I'm freelance for them, but on a contract. But there and elsewhere, if you get a fascinating, interesting, juicy commission, then you respond accordingly. Or you might have something that's you know, less interesting, but it's a job. And without realizing it, I certainly started spinning my wheels a bit. And after 10 years, I, I really realized I had to completely rethink what photography is to me. And I decided either, you know, either quit and go and do something else or rethink this you know from the ground up and I realized that photography is a vocation I want to make pictures and I want to get better and I want to have a voice if that doesn't sound too pretentious but even it's just for myself it's not for other people I, the work really matters and maybe I will put the work before the job and that probably is something I should have worked out very early but it definitely took me a decade so I started working for myself and thinking if I do that, maybe the job will fall into place. And it, it really has. I mean, I, 
I wish I'd worked the penny had dropped earlier. So the work I started doing for myself started meaning that the commissions I got were better. So BAFTA came after that. They started noticing work that I'd been putting on. It could have been Instagram back then. It may have been, actually it may have been other projects I started doing for myself meant that that freedom and that great commission from BAFTA very much was in response to my own work that was much more, again, try not to sound pretentious, about my own voice in a way that, say, doing commissions day in and day out for The Guardian and for other clients or editorially, you're, you know, that's the publication's voice more than mine. And it, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm doubling back on myself. but I, And this, I started after BAFTA. Um, I'm a insomniac, so I'm often up late at night and I live in Camden and I just, I've always been interested. I like public, you know, lots of, photographers love public transport but I became interested in that idea of sort of the last journey in a city of between say 2 and 4 a.m when people are either going home they're finishing work or maybe they've you know it's Saturday night maybe they've hooked up with someone and they're going but it's their last they're not going anywhere else that night and I shot over a few years on sort of Friday and Saturday nights, really in the middle of the night, sort of between two and 4 a.m., I would say. And I shot them all on a 50 mil lens. So it's sort of manual focus, quite close lens. You have to be near people. Um, and there's an element of risk in that. I mean, you really, as a photographer, need to be in the right headspace to walk up to strangers in the middle of the night, quite close on a, on a, on a 50 mil. Um, and I found the challenge in the, of that fascinating. And I think the title, um, I may be a bit above myself, but the, the buses and bus stops are lit and it gives them a very Edward Hopper-esque look to me. And I find that interesting. There's something cinematic. And the thing I like about Hopper is there's something lonely about his people lit against the night. And I, I just found that interesting. And I thought... You don't need the best commission. I don't need to be waiting for someone, some magazine to ring me and say, you're going to photograph this fascinating person in California. I can make my own work. And, you know, I'm quite busy doing my day-to-day -day job, which doesn't give me the time necessarily to, you know, follow an Inuit tribe for three months. And I, you know, I wish I could do that kind of work, but I'm so gummed up with day-to-day -day work. I, I realised, and it took me a long time to realise, there are stories right on your doorstep and I can find the time. I, you know, I'm a night owl myself. I'm awake often till four in the morning on a Friday and Saturday. Let's make something of that. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer, but this work comes from that. Um, it's, it's ongoing, actually. I've slightly paused it in the pandemic. I love this. And I didn't, I had to ask someone about this. This was at nearly four in the morning and it was, I think it's Ethiopian New Year. I, I could, someone in the audience could correct me on that. It was so moving. There's a lot of women all in white. Um, and I, it's definitely an Ethiopian Christian tradition of some kind, which, and I think it's visiting lots of churches and then they were going home. Um, but I, I love the relationship with my city that I got from doing this. And sometimes I'd see the same faces at 3 a.m. going past again and there was one guy I took his portrait twice and he sort of you know we'd chat because he worked in a nightclub and would stand at the bus stop at half past three and he you know, kind of saw me there I would pretend to be waiting for a bus and listening to music was my kind of disguise to do this um <laughs> yeah I mean this is bus stop lighting and there are different bus stops have different lighting and I, I came I had a there were two stops which are my favorites <laughs> Is it fluorescent lighting? So you have to that, um, that there's an advertising hoarding at the end of the bus stop on the on one side, the side that's lighting her. So as the advert, it's got electronic, it flicks over stills, but say 10 in a sequence. And so mm -hmm. different light would throw out depending on what was depicted in the picture. Um, and so I was hovering actually back and, and then fortuitously, just, she just turned and, and I loved her face actually. And, and it's interesting. I'm sort of, it's a strange thing to do. And certainly if I'd photographed a woman, particularly by themselves in the early hours of the morning, I would usually go up to them afterwards and say, I hope you don't mind. I just took your photograph. This is why I've taken it. Um, I mean, I'm a big believer in the adage. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. But 
I didn't, yeah, I didn't have any trouble from people. And I think maybe it helps that I'm a woman, not a man, possibly, I mean, unfairly. Um, and I think there's a way people can sometimes tell your intentions from the way you approach them. But I didn't want to ask anyone before I photographed them because then people become self-conscious and the image becomes something different, you know. Um, so with her, I did actually tell her what I'd done afterwards and she was fine about it. But it was a glass backed bus stop. So she's through the glass to me. So you can sort of see the reflections on the glass. Um, how, how difficult or easy do you find it to go up to people and ask for forgiveness? Um, <clears throat> I find it, it depends on my mood. I, I need to be in the right frame of mind and it doesn't take much to knock. Funnily enough, I, I never had any trouble from anyone I photographed. Either they didn't see me doing it, or I would explain to them afterwards. Or if they said, oh, what are you doing? I'd say, you know, I'm doing this. And then I would often on my phone have examples of work I'd shot before to say it's actually part of the series. And people, 100% of the subjects that either approach me or I approach them were fine. What I did have a few times, and I hate to say it, but it was always a man would come up and say, they'd see what I was doing and say, you can't do that, it's against the law, and get very aggressive. And I said, well, I'm not photographing you and it's not against the law, but that normally, then my confidence was a bit shaken by that and I would give up for the evening or give up for a few weeks. I, there were a few incidents and oddly, they were never from the people who were photographed. It was always from someone who took it upon themselves to um, put me in my place. And it, I'm afraid whilst I could tell them explain what I was doing and saying that it, you know legally it was fine and my confidence then would have taken a knock and I'd, I'd be off it for a, a while um, but in general yeah you I need you do need to psych yourself up actually I find um, there is confidence required and with me in particular it's a delicate balance I'm quite good at standing my ground but internally that will knock me a bit if, if if someone challenges me like that, I, I get a bit, yeah, I'll give them some lip back, but then wobble inside and go off and not take any more images um, for a while. Yeah. yeah, I think we all understand that. Those of us who even try some, some uh, street- but, uh, oh, Sorry to interrupt you. I would say actually, because I believe it quite strongly is for top, or art in general and photography, yeah, I think is art and it is also other things and I wouldn't call myself an artist but I think you have to have a streak of ruthlessness about what it is you want to create there's no point there has to be a single-mindedness and now I think you can have a ruthlessness and I would say mine is tempered with I've got quite a gentle view I love people when I photograph them I, re I feel incredibly tender towards nearly every subject I have even if there's someone I don't actually like I do when I'm pointing a lens at them. And that's me. I mean, I'm not saying that's the right way to be. That just happens to be my way of being. But in order, when you see an image and you want it, and it was what I was trying to explain earlier about, it took me a long time for the penny to drop on this, but once it did, making images is incredibly important to me. The work does matter. For, its, for me and my own sake, I, I wouldn't presume to think about having an audience or my work lasting or anything like that. But I, you know, when I take my last breath, you know, I want to have been a nice person to, to you know, have done well by the people I love. And I want to have not wasted my time and done some work that I feel matters. And you know, if I can say that at the end, then I'll be happy. And to have that, I think you need an element of ruthlessness. The mm. picture, if I see it and it means I need to walk three feet closer and that's going to put me in a bit of risk, I'll do it if the picture is there. So... Now, for me, that's tempered by I don't ever want a person to feel exploited or horribly uncomfortable. I won't. It's tempered, but I can still, you know, I think it's a novelist or whatever who talked about the shard of glass that's in the heart of everyone who creates. And there is, a, there has to be a tiny bit of getting the work matters to me. Now, how much nerve I have depends on different days. And I do also have a set of principles that are personal to me. I don't think, you know, I think everyone makes their own way on this kind of stuff um yeah i, I don't, don't know if that makes sense sorry yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. so something like this if i see the image i will go to some length to get it oh. here's a good good opportunity to ask a color really um referencing to the sorry the question referencing to the transition from the black and white to the color which you know, was there any particular reason that's a question from edward foster 
Um, I, I mean, black and white when I shot Iris Murdoch was mainly because I didn't know how to print colour and I had no access to a coloured darkroom. So when I was a student, I shot a lot of black and white. Um, I was quite afraid of colour, actually, because colour was colour film. It can be more unforgiving than black and white, I found, and I didn't know how to print it. Later, I got into colour and I started work. And actually, I, I think I, as a photographer, I'm more interested in colour than I am black and white. I like... I mean, I don't know. I never studied it, so I don't know anything about colour theory. But I think someone told me that I use colour theory, which I didn't know I did. But I, I find telling a story or an image using colour is just what interests me most. I'm really interested in colour. So there's only, I mean, BAFTA is a kind of aberration to that. I chose to take away the colour because there's too much going on. There's too much noise. My story, that, and they're also, they, BAFTA employs not just me, it's got a kind of stable of fantastic photographers that I'm overwhelmed to be a part of. You know, I, I, it's great the way they, and other people are telling colour stories there. What I'm choosing to tell, I think, is simpler in black and white. And I do sometimes see an image and just think, yeah, because black and white is tone and texture and light works differently. Um, and also, I suppose, using, I shoot mainly on digital, I started my career on film, but I do shoot mainly on digital and that very much started because clients wouldn't pay for film anymore, certainly editorially. Um, but I, I, I like my digital likers and I think the quality has caught up in a really interesting way. Um, and I find something about the kind of, you, there can be a bad habit to grayscale an image that doesn't work in colour and create this sort of, it kind of works in black and white. And I try and avoid that. I try and very much think I'm shooting this in colour, it is colour. Apart from the BAFTAs, which, and often for that, actually, there is a monochrome Leica camera, which I can't afford myself, but they lend me quite often to do that job. <laughs> and that means I'm actually, it means even if the client then went, oh, do you have that in colour? I say, no, I really don't. It doesn't exist. It, it's a black and white frame. If that That's nice. Yeah. So, um, and following up, really, you, you spoke about creating a body of work. So how much of that is a result of what's driving you or for an experience of a moment? Or, or is it really about the buzz of what you're doing? It's all indivisible. Um, I mean, there's a kind of, I've talked about ruthlessness. I'm now about to make myself sound even worse. There's a kind of selfishness. I cannot believe that I get to do this for a living. I mean, even if it's a job I'm not that interested in, it's still taking pictures, which is fascinating. But making the work is really important to me. And I would say that that's a vocation. I just want to make pictures and to please myself and to feel that I haven't wasted my time. Yeah, I can't do anything else. That's what I want to do. But also pictures are, and I think I've spent a lot, you know, I've not solely worked for The Guardian, but I spent enough time with a foot in that camp that I think like a press photographer, that it gives you a, a champagne lifestyle on beer prices. I mean, where, what other job where, and I'm, interested in people I'm interested in the world I read the paper I did as a teenager yeah I could be in a cabinet minister's office listening to an interview or in a home for a refuge for abused women or backstage with the Bolshoi ballet watching them I mean it's an incredible job I mean it's a difficult job but if you can get into it the variety the way photography allows you to see the world and to experience people and to have a balanced round view of experience and humanity. I can't think of anything else like it. And, you know, I'm a professional lurker. I sit and I watch and I listen to people who interest me. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers, I think in answer to the question, it's all three of those things. Um, yeah. Very much answer. completely indivisible for me. I mean, it's just, uh -huh. Great. And, and wrapping that up, Simon Madison made a, a statement earlier um, when we're talking about uh, getting the pictures, long live lurking. <laughs> well, I, it's funny because not every photographer brings in my limited experience. And I, as I say about imposter syndrome, I feel I'm, I've just I've had a 21 year career and I really hope, you know, touching some wood, that I get to live long enough and work long enough for this to be a mid stage of my career. But I am aware that everyone brings something different to the table. And I mean, certainly earlier, I couldn't, you know, I was very hung up about, oh, God, I'm not as good as him. I can't, well, how can I do that? How did, and I realized the only person, the only photographer I can be on a job or personally is me. I don't know how to be anyone else. And you bring yourself 
to it. If you're a very confident alpha male who I've seen, you know, at the BAFTAs, for example, I watched Greg Williams work who he's just extraordinary. He's the most alpha male I've ever met. And these huge A-list stars and celebrities bow down to him like sort of puppies showing their tummies. They're so, and they love him, but they're subordinate to him. And then he gets the image by that access. And when I first saw him doing that, I just thought, oh, good God, I can't do that. What on earth? Why, oh God, this is a disaster. And then I realised I can't. I do what I do, which is a sort of, you know, wry lurking and a little bit of eye contact and a, a sense of connection in a much more low key way, because that's who I am. And that's the images I make. Um, I think going on from that, because it, there's a there's a mix now of the next section of some commissions and some that aren't commissions. Uh, and we we stray into uh, some of the things that have happened in the last 12 months, I think, with some of these portraits. Uh, the first one, I think, is uh, is lovely, is Lenny. Um, I, I, when Alan asked me to send some images, I wasn't sure what to send. I, I thought I'd send, I sent a few portraits that were a mixture of commissioned and non-commissioned and this was commissioned for the Guardian and it was Lenny Henry and actually he was giving a a um a uh, interview about the underrepresentation of black and ethnic minority actors writers and producers in the arts and the television industry and he was just finishing his PhD I think in literature and that subject and it, it was very this is not the Lenny Henry of sort of his um, you know, comedy shows. This is a serious figure representing, you know, BAME interests in the arts. And it, we shot in a, it was like a members club in Soho and we had a room and it wasn't ideal. And actually I was, I'd shot some pictures I was pleased with and I was packing up my kit on the floor. And then I saw this picture, which was by far the as often happens actually whenever as a photographer you've told the subject that you're finished that's when they relax and you see the image that you actually want um and it, it got it was the first time i got into the taylor wessing prize um which is something i was just delighted about because i i mean competitions are competitions and they're all controversial in their own way but that is one that i feels really interesting conversation annually and nationally about portraiture and where Britain is with portraiture and what portraiture is representing. And it's really controversial because sometimes photographers strongly disagree with the direction it takes. But I, I love throwing my hat in the ring, even though it hurts not to get in. Getting in is fantastic, but it's, I like being part of that conversation and viewing my own portraiture. Anyway, lots of waffle, but that, yeah, that was Lenny Henry shop for the Guardian. But um, I try now and, now this, again, I, entered, I did three that got into the Taylor West thing. This was commissioned by, it was a job that I suggested to the Guardian myself. And as I started to get more confident, I started bringing things to them, which actually was great. And then they would run them. And I don't know why it didn't occur to me years earlier to do that. Um, and this was a thing I did with a, a writer friend who I worked with a lot called Laura Barton. And it was about Friday night meals. And this was an efficient chip shop in Wigan where she was interviewing people and I was doing candid portraiture and we did various other places around the country just about what people do on their Friday nights and this is actually a 13 year old boy so I did have his permission and I got in touch with his father and things afterwards um, even though he looks about 19 um, and I thought he looked like sort of James Dean meets Elvis and it was a freezing cold November night in Wigan queuing in a chippy and it's the kind of shot I would have just taken 100% I would have taken that if I'd seen it, I would take it. I didn't need to be commissioned to take that picture. Um, but it turned in, you know, to a part of this piece in The Guardian that was quite successful and, you know, made it into the Taylor Wessing. And it, it, I can't remember, was that about six years ago? It was, the penny had dropped that there really shouldn't be a line between what I'm commissioned to do and what I do because I need to do to, to be better and to kind of develop. Um. <laughs> This, uh, well, funnily enough, this has now been published, and I was really delighted, in Italian Vogue um, this month, oddly. But uh, that is a friend of mine, Charlie Gilmore, um, and he's now written a book about fathers and adopting a, a baby magpie that caused chaos in his life. And that was him and his wife, who's a very beautiful artist called Janina, and this horrific magpie 
that was as mischievous as any magpie in literature or folklore. And the magpie, I have three marks across my cornea that will never heal, thanks to Benzine, the magpie. She flew at my eyes and took my contact lens out of my eyes with her claws, um, leaving her mark. So this was the last time I photographed her without wearing a pair of uh, like Bunsen burner goggles to protect myself. Um, but I just did this for the joy of it because who wouldn't want to photograph a beautiful young couple with a magpie? I mean, I, I remember sort of Charlie said, you know, I've got the bird and you haven't photographed it. And I just drove, they live in Peckham and I drove down on a Saturday afternoon, you know, certainly didn't need a commission. I just, and, and Charlie and his wife are absurdly cheekbony and sort of hauntingly beautiful. And the magpie just, I thought made things really interesting. I, yeah. It was the second time I photographed the magpie that it maimed me for life. But um, anyway, less said about that, the better. Um, and again, this is another Taylor Wessing one, but I, I like the, I wanted to try and put, you know, one was commissioned for the Guardian, one I suggested to the Guardian. This one, I was walking through Regent's Park and I think, yeah, I suppose technically it would be street photography, although it was, I mean, just the gods, I think some, what I was trying to say earlier, that people see your intention you know, when you say, do you have to be brave to approach people? So it was a hot day in, I think, May. So one of the early hot days of the year. And I was walking and I had my dog on a lead and a bag of shopping in my other hand. And I, you know, instead of getting the bus back from town, I decided to walk because it was so nice. And I was walking through Regent's Park and I saw this family sitting on a bench in perfect light. Um, and I just thought, God, this, they were very exposed. There was no way I could secretly lurk and get a picture of them without revealing myself, not least because I had a bag of shopping and a dog. And I always carry a Leica with me wherever I go with one lens. And I had a 35 mil on. And I was sort of looking at them thinking, can I do it? Dare I do it? Or will I just you know, get shouted at? Or will I be ruining the day? And the woman in the pink looked up at me, saw me chat, oh, would you like to take our picture? And I said, well, God, I'd love to. And that I have to say, any photographers who are listening, that just never happens. It was a gift. Um, so I put the dog lead and the shopping bag between my knees. So it probably looked completely ridiculous. And I just said, oh, just pretend I'm not here. And I took about five frames. Um, and this one, there was another frame that I liked more than this, that I thought I was entering to the Taylor Wessing. And it was only when it got in which um, that I realized the printer had done the wrong print, printed the wrong frame. So actually this one got into the Taylor Wessing, but it's not my favorite one. There's another image. Uh, they sent the wrong frame off, but it worked out um, well. But that kind of thing, I mean, that's a lot to you know, risk of sounding like Jimmy from Superman, carrying a camera with you. It's a wise thing to do because I could have walked past that and had no camera. And yeah, they may well have said, you know, bugger off, we're having a nice time, to, don't disturb us. But actually, yeah, they didn't. And I hope that some of that is that people can read your intentions. I mean, it doesn't always work. And sometimes people are very hostile. But in that instance, it was a really natural moment. Now, Joe, which one is Joe? Is that Joe? Um, these are often subjects of mine. In the middle is Pippa, who's one of my dearest, closest friends, and her sons, who are identical twins. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this was when they were 16, so a couple of years ago. They're, they're 18 now. Joe is the more feminine one with the blonde hair and the sort of 1950s toweling robe. And Duke is the one who looks more sort of suspicious of me. And... I mean, they're like surrogate family to me. I, I love them and they're immensely photogenic, which is just a gift for a photographer to have friends. But they're fascinating because Joe and Duke are identical twins. Since Joe was two years old, he's always loved makeup. He's training to be a makeup artist now. He's always had false eyelashes, dyes his hair. He's very feminine. And his brother, you know, is like a little Ray Winston. Um, but they're identical and they are fantastic. But I love them as well. It's a sort of... It's an on, I would say it's a series, but it's not. I mean, they're people I love and I photograph the people I love often. I mean, I can't help it. And they're, I mean, they, I have to say, uh, forgive my turn of phrase, but they rip the piss out of me endlessly for taking their picture, but they're very tolerant. Um, I normally get two frames and then they'll pull a face and go, yeah, enough, roll their eyes. But um, yeah, I'm lucky to have people I love who are such wonderful uh, subjects. And this was, we'd been swimming, uh, 
friends live in an apartment block in Ealing that has a pool and we just had a barbecue and a pool day and I was very, it's my 35 mil in a flash that I like using, I particularly like using a fill flash in the summer. Um, mm. it, 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 they are, that they, I, I would never tire of photographing these two. Um, they may tire of me long before I tire of them taking their picture. Now the last one, that one is one that you really were talking about. Uh, um, well, this is a couple of years later. This is um, this spring. And um, this, which I was really pleased and psychologically meant a lot to me that it, it made it into the um, National Portrait Gallery and the Duchess of Cambridge did a hundred pictures to represent lockdown called Hold Still. And it was an open competition, open to you know, anyone in Britain. And I think they had 35,000 entries or something. So I'm very proud it got in. And this is Joe and Duke, in fact, the title I don't normally give my works title, but but this is Joe and Duke locked down a few days before their 18th birthday. And it is exactly that. Um, their mother had made some surgical masks you know, or sort of, you know, this is when you could only meet people to pick up medical equipment or you know, buy food. And their mother had a sort of side business making masks. So I went to pick up some from her. And this is in the window at the front of their flat. Um, and for me, I was shielding um, for a lot of this year. Um, so for the first few months of lockdown, I didn't even use a camera um, because you know, we were constantly being told you can't touch your face, you can't put things near your face. And, you know, we didn't, I, I mean, I remember at that point I wore latex gloves all the time and I, you know, any photograph I took was just on my iPhone because I wouldn't dare put my Leica up next to my face because it felt like a dirty object. I mean, it was a kind of painful time for the whole country and you know that for me was something that was quite difficult and after a few months I decided actually I thought it probably was safe to use a camera and you know I had my camera with me and I think for this um I think Joe was just lying on those quilts in the window Joe is the one with the blonde hair and I you know said come on could you get your brother come on so, and, yeah and they posed for a, a couple of frames in the window but I, I was very and I think that is from having an ongoing relationship where I don't really see that division between my commissioned, my professional career work and my personal work, it's just indivisible. And for them, I've shot them so much that you know, as photographer and subject, having trust is obviously such an important element. And I'm very fortunate with them, there is a lot of trust. Um, but no, I was really delighted that we kind of... Yeah. Um, and I'm glad, you know, it sums up it's honest I think it, it's not staged and it's I mean it's staged in that I had to pull one brother in you know but he's wearing his dressing gown because it was that stage of lockdown where yeah they barely got dressed um and that you know both of them so frustrated but uh actually a pleased report they're both doing very well now then they're, they're, they've both got jobs and they're less locked down um well funnily enough this is them again <laughs> This was me messing around. I borrowed a underwater camera from Leica just for a weekend. And uh, I, I don't know which twin brother's feet that is, but it's Joe or Duke. Um, that's the, it's taken on the same day as the other shots actually, but that's me underwater and one of them swimming away. And I like the flash and the bubbles. I mean, I, there's not much to say about it, but it's again, I, mean, I think, I, mean, I hope I'm not insufferable to, the people I love because I'm always there with the camera but and certainly for the first 10 years of my career I wasn't like that you know I loved photography and I was a photographer but I was almost nine to five a photographer whereas now you know every commission I get excites me but I'm just as excited by the possibility of taking this or or doing a personal series that I think might exhibit and have a kind of structure and a um you know, more of a status, you know, pictures like this just become part of life of, of people I love. Um, this is this is a commissioned portrait. This is Michael Kiwanaka, um, who just won the Mercury Prize this year, but this was a couple of summers ago. And a joy in that it was some awful basement office room off the Tottenham Court Road where we were assigned to do the picture. And because it was such a beautiful day, I persuaded him and his press officer 
to get in my Fiat 500 and drive to Regent's Park, where there's a really quiet, long grass spot, which I know works well for pictures. Um, and it was just a lovely day. And he was really in the mood for it. And he sort of, you know, now with COVID, it seems unlikely, but I straddled him in a very um, non-Me Too, entirely consensual, non-creepy way. And, you know, I, I can't remember what I'd said that made him laugh so much, but uh, I love that image. And I love his music. So again, in answer to the question Sean was saying about, uh, yeah, it's just a privilege. Yeah, what a pleasure to love a musician and their work. And then you get to have this tiny little relationship with them when you do a portrait. It's they're like mini friendships, or can be when they work out at their best. Mm. We're back to the same day. I'm glad you've chosen these. Yeah, and that is the boy's mother. Just in, I mean, this is me messing about with my one day experiment with underwater photography. <laughs> but I love it, it was just dusk and uh, they are a very photogenic family. I mean, uh, and honestly, I don't think they even really notice me taking photographs actually. I do it so often when they're around and, and other friends of mine who I, it's part of our relationship is that I have a camera. Um, but then actually accidentally that turns into a body of work. Um, so, but it, it's not cynical, actually. It's not ruthless or cynical. It's it just is what it is, really. Um, I think I've seen that lurking around on your Instagram. <laughs> you, you, uh, yeah. I mean, the people who are in my life who I love, oddly, probably are another series of work in a sense. But yeah. it's not cynical, and there's no ruthlessness. It's just yeah. for me. But, photography, in some slightly different way, and it's really hard to say this without sounding like a bit of a nerk, but it is an act of love photography as well. I and mean, then that's just me, I know it isn't, and you know, I, I, I can think of lots of photographers whose work I adore, and it very clearly isn't an act of love, but it, it is. So the people I care most about appear over and over again in my personal work, but that's just an expression of how I feel about them. I, I, yeah, it's Definitely. impossible not to. We're going to move on to, to West of West in a few minutes. Do the twins appear in that one as well? Uh, no, no, that's entirely candid and um, okay. Uh, entirely candid and sort of that's much more personal mm. work, but that is a sort of series within a box. Whereas, um, yeah, I think sort of friends and loved ones who very much yeah, Joe and Duke do appear again and again, and you know, they are such obvious subjects, but. Uh, that's a much looser, I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, maybe in 30 years, I can look back and say it's a series and edit it down, but it isn't shot in any way like that. It's just an expression of, aff of affection. Mm -hmm. This was from Harry and Meghan's royal wedding. And, and we've got two, two it's, it's funny, the two pictures I, I've got that, that I saw of those, one of them, this one reminds me very much of the, la the, the last, um, um, what was the Martin Power series in New Brighton? The use um, of the flash and so on, and the colour. Yeah, um, it's not not deliberately. Um, I mean, I wouldn't presume really to. I mean, I I, I love part of not all of it, but I, I mean, New Brighton is extraordinary, and I suppose mm. anyone shooting a Union Jack with a flash, but I wouldn't presume to to even try and imitate. Pa, I, mean, I, think he's I didn't think I didn't say you were imitating, it was just reminiscent of him. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I like a flash on a sunny day. Mm. Um, and I really do, I love that effect. Um, and wherever I, you know, Pa and other people, it, it's sort of, I hope I, I like it in myself, but I like that freezing of a moment and I like what it does to colour, really. I mean, and I think, I think it does something really interesting with colour that, um, particularly on a sunny, and that was a boiling hot day, and it just really lent itself to that consistency that shooting everything with the mm. flash and... Um, the, the next one, which I'm going to show, put up, actually reminds me of a shot of uh, George V, George the VI, you know, the, the 1936 or 37 um, uh, coronation where Cartier-Bresson took people, pictures of people on the lions in Trafalgar Square. And this one to me is a modern version of that because I think the people would have been doing that had the equipment been available. Yeah, well, 
I mean, I should be so lucky. If it even slightly reminds you, then that's <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I just I love the way there is there is something that Flash does th that freezing that I particularly like, um, and I. I, I, I mean, I, I know complete artists who use off camera and camera flash at the same time in the sun. And, you know, I'm afraid I'm very simple. I just use one, you know, one on camera flash that almost sits. I use an old sort of secondhand 1970s Olympus flash gun because it sits. These are all shot on my 35 mil F2 lens. And I like the end of the flash and the lens sort of front element sit almost together. And I quite like the mm. effect of that, whether I'm in risk of frying my Leica using an old flash I'm not sure hopefully not um, but yeah I, I mean oddly they weren't even photographing the wedding this was photographing the rehearsal the day before the wedding and that, that is a little bit of that that tickled me this incredible seriousness and there was just empty carriages going by <laughs> um, it's it, I yeah there was a man actually there was another picture I took in the series who he was standing just behind me when I took this and he turned around and he sort of he had a Union Jack hat on and was I don't know must be in his early 70s you know well that was a lot of fuss about nothing as the last empty carriage went by and everyone uh, I sort of loved it there's something very British and kind of very lovable about the pageantry which was really for a rehearsal but um <laughs> yeah I mean also god looking back now standing in a crowd how I love <laughs> to do that again speaking of crowds we're going to see quite a few in this this series there's a lot of people have asked questions about this before, and and I really love the again you're using the flash here to illuminate the inside of the car. I think it's great. Um, well, I'm a bit conscious I've been ra rabbiting on, but um, this is my husband uh, used to live in California. He used he's an academic, and he used to teach one quarter every year at Caltech. To actually, teach literature at Caltech, so literature to rocket scientists, and it meant that I spent. You know, 10, 11 weeks of the year in California and we would do jobs for British clients over there. Um, and we, we sort of go, we just, when travel was a thing that people could do, um, we would always sort of spend our summer holidays there because we've got lots of friends there. And a few years ago, there is a point to this anecdote, I promise, I took up surfing, even though I'm no good at it and too old and, you know, geriatric beginner surfer, but I loved it. And there's, there's a funny thing is you sit, you have to paddle out through the waves and the Pacific's quite aggressive and you get a certain sense of achievement, even getting out to what's known as the lineup. But then you sit on your surfboard and you look back. And I, had, I never had it before after years of going to California, this sense that you're on the edge. Yeah, this is the west of America and behind you is Japan. And, you know, in front of you is the edge and it's this kind of melting pot. And the, the pier in Santa Monica, I don't know who knows California, is technically the end of Route 66, um, which is also known as the Christopher Columbus Transcontinental Highway, that if you follow it, stretches across the entire United States. And I just thought, I started to, and I love the light and I love the brightness and the sort of variety of people and the sense that this was a kind of place that people come to be. If they're very poor, some of them are hopeless. They come literally, they go out there to just be bums in the sun, you know, because they've lost everything. And other people are rich people, like these people who are at a Mustang convention on Santa Monica Pier, you know, very proud of his Rolex and his driving gloves and kind yeah. of, uh, he was a rather severe, severe looking guy. And suddenly, as I was sort of sitting out at sea, the idea of doing a coherent project started to form. And so basically, every time I went surfing, I would then go, over about three years and spend hours prowling and I mean it wasn't so much lurking more prowling in this instance and I limited myself to shooting on a th you know so the Nighthawks was all shot on a natural light and a 50 mil lens I like having parameters if I'm doing something specific so these were all shot on a 35 f2 lens and not at f2 and with a fill flash um, and it was to try and you know I shot quite a lot to, before it all sort of began to pull together. And my writer collaborator, who I met at The Guardian, but she does radio and novels and film scripts and all sorts of other things. Laura Barton um, wrote a long essay for me. And basically this turned into a book, um, which came out in January and then a pandemic happened. So I've almost forgotten that it was a book, but uh, yeah. Who's the publisher? 
Um, Unbound. Mm. Unbound. It is actually, uh, here we are. I can, uh, this is not, I didn't deliberately have it next to me, I just noticed it. There we are. It's an actual book with a cover and everything. Um, I like that frame, it's her foot. I don't know if you've noticed it. That frame for me is all about the bride's foot. Um, and it was a weird thing, people go and have their wedding photos, but there are people wet from the sea walking back. I mean, I, and I like the, the melting pot of humanity element of this project. Um, and colour, it was all about colour, kind of joy, his socks, and he'd won that weird, I don't even know what it is, I think it's like a Mexican wrestling chili. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And I love, yeah, I mean, it was about observed moments and colour, and it was just a total pleasure to do. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was a joy. And in terms of bravery, so whereas Nighthawks, you have to be very careful, being a tourist and using a flash in the bright sun, it was like a suit. It was like having the sort of Harry Potter invisibility cloak. I could walk right up to people and take their pictures. And as soon as I said something and they heard my you know, accent isn't American, it was just you know, people let me do whatever I wanted visually. And that was, you know, whereas in Britain, I would have been told to sod off quite quickly. But in America, yeah, somehow mm. I was just allowed to do what I liked. That's a fairground ride called Shark Frenzy. And I think it's the most photogenic fairground ride I've ever seen. They are works of art, those sharks. And they sort of spin round on a Wurlitzer. They're like Wurlitzer cars, but mm. sharks. Um, and I love those kids. I'm sort of, But their parents saw me take that picture and didn't mind. I mean, it's extraordinary. Yeah. So asking a question related to that then from, came from Joe and Pete. Do you carry consent forms with you? Um, no. <laughs> Yeah, as I say, I imagine not, particularly for the American ones. Um, I no, I don't. Um, and slightly, but you can't legally, you can't um, advertise a, a product or, uh, I can't remember the wording, but you, there is a proviso. You can, this for street photography, and it exists. And I can't remember legally, we had to check with the book, but it was all right, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think, I mean, I couldn't sell this to an advertiser who wanted to, you know, thought it would be great to, uh, a, a product and service. You can't use a person's mm. image identifiably without consent um, yeah. to to market a product or service, but you can use it in the context of um, photogen. Not in France, you can't, but you can <laughs> yes. uh, in Britain. And, um, you yeah, know, these are always very close I think you really I think you've said that you generally would walk up you'd going up with a close lens but do you ever crop to get even closer rarely I mean they're all shot on a 35 mil which mm -hmm. you know I think of a sort of medium wide I mean I don't have any long lenses and I don't have any super wide lenses I really sort of work I'd say 98 percent of my career is between 28 mil and 50 mil <laughs> not a massive so I would think of this as medium wide um no I just go close but in America it was sort of I don't know how and I think it's because of people's you know people have come to this place to be in the sun or to display their wealth or to end their days I mean it's a sort of funny melting pot and you know, Laura wrote this great essay about frontierism and the sense that you go west it's the american dream you cross the plains and you go west and there you have it the light it's you know hollywood started there because of the light and the way it works and there is something i don't know people were very receptive to having a kind of weird english lady walking up and taking their picture i mean these guys uh, in fact you've picked the only two photographs in i think the entire book where they're looking to camera the 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 japanese schoolboy and you, I kept seeing Japanese schoolboys in full school uniform with ties, and it would be sort of 95 degrees. It was obviously part of a, you know, school trip where they go to the beach, but they have to, you know, the poor kids would have to wear their like trousers and black lace-up shoes and ties the entire time. Um, I once saw a, a group of Japanese schoolgirls in Sydney on Bondi Beach in kilts. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. I mean, I just. The, the teachers, it struck me as very unkind to send them to the beach for the day in their full sort of, you know, British boarding school uniforms. But anyway, these were twin, two twins um, who had moved from Russia to make their, um, and they always wore identical clothes, which was slightly eerie, but that they had come to, you know, like so many people to LA to make their fortune in the entertainment industry. Um, I haven't yet seen them anywhere else. 
Yeah, this guy was promoting Hanukkah with this, there's a sort of enormous, that metallic <laughs> structure was a giant menorah made of sort of pipes and things. I mean, it's a, it's a weird melting pot. But yeah, I, I loved his menorah hat um, and his sticky out Prince Charles ears. Sorry, I mean, it's about detail and colour, but I like the, you know, the reds and the blues. I worked for two years in Pennsylvania, and they used to say that America was tilted to the left and down a bit, and all the loose nuts ended ended up in South California. Maybe I couldn't possibly comment since I <laughs> myself there. I mean, yeah, I'm kind of rattling around like a loose nut with the rest of them. <laughs> Hot dog on a stick. The nice ladies who work, and they gave me a huge iced lemonade for free after I took this. I couldn't resist. They were all laughing with each other. It was like a, it sold lemonade, really over sugared lemonade and hot dogs on sticks, which I didn't try. And it was a snack <laughs> thing. And I waited in the queue and then took the picture without permission, but then explained what I'd done. And they were so nice as, a, you know, I, I do think in England, I'd have been given the middle finger. And there they gave me a massive pint of lemonade and smiled at me. And that was that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, they, those uniforms uh, yeah, didn't flatter them. I like these next to the juxtaposition of this one uh, and this one, and they, they sort of similarity. Yeah, and I tried in the book. I had quite fun doing the layout, actually, to try and make those relationships between that hopefully say something larger, hopefully, about the, the subject. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's an area near, I mean, the, the, the narcissists and the, the show-off element of... California, the you know, Venice Beach, Santa Monica is legendary. Um, and you know, people go there to do their yoga in public and to be watched by tourists. And I don't know what he was doing, but it was a kind of artful falling, as far as I could tell. It was sort of muscular falling. He kept doing that quite a lot, but I loved it. I mean, sort of, it looks so broken and painful, but kind of wonderful too. Um, yeah, oh, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Actually, this I did slightly stalk this child. I saw him walking around with that huge donut that he'd won. In the, there's a fun fair on the pier, and he'd won. And I think he'd won two things. He has a little kind of Pokemon thing under his arm. Um, and I saw him walking around, and I loved that his t-shirt matched the railings. And I did keep my eye on him, um, slightly like a creepy stalker, till he just went and stood. And there's something in his shoulders, the kind of listlessness he'd kind of had enough by then looking out um, but yeah some of the pictures emerge in front of you and some of them you spot the bones of a picture and then think right I know it I can feel in my gut that that will turn into a picture if I just stick with this person so um anyway I, I, I say it as a very benign stalking um yeah <laughs> I, think... I took from him was the image not nothing else I think that if I remember right that's the last tease Sarah, have we got any more questions, uh, Sean? I do have a couple here. So um, Simon Madison asked, what was the name of the book again, please? Oh, good. well, bless you for asking, Simon. Thank you very much. It's called West of West. Um, and it, yeah, my notion there's nothing West of West. Yeah, you're, you're there. There's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I've got one, really. It's, it's really, a, you know, you fell into um, a line of employment that you enjoy and it's sustained. And it's interesting that you, you never set out on that path and you started look with, with literature as your, your topic. So thinking back to that study of literature, does, did that inform you how, about how you put your images together? Are they words? Are they sentences? Or are they paragraphs? Oh, good God. Um, I, I, mean, I think it plays into what I was saying, that you can only bring yourself to the table. And I don't really... Yeah, I, I often, actually, I have a number of friends who are writers and they often say, oh, you know, but when are you going to write a book? I think that I'm not a writer, I'm a photographer. And I feel it, I'm not sure it's as coherent as a paragraph as such, but it is a statement of some sort. I'm quite, I think often with work, you have to look back on it and sort of pull it together. Um, although West of West, I did actually start shooting it and think this is a book. I, I can see that um, it has something to say. Um, but I think, I mean, I'm really glad. And 
not studying photography means there are technical things I wish I knew that I really you know, I'm a bit ropey on. And there is an element of winging it, I find, to photography that maybe if I'd spent several years studying it and then been an assistant, that I'd have more of a technical grounding than I do. Um, but I'm glad I loved, I mean, I was really lucky. Yeah, you know, I went to I went to UCL before they had tuition fees and I studied for free when London was booming in the mid nineties. And I'm so glad of it. And, you know, read all the books that I now spend my time not reading and scrolling through my phone or taking pictures. You know, I'm, I'm glad. And whatever I did then must have made me into the photographer I am now. Um, but yes, I, yeah. I'm glad I don't have to write. I'm glad. You know, essay crises were a nightmare, whereas now, yeah, you know, 125th of a second and I've done it. That's, um, yeah, yeah. great. Well, lovely. Um, it, thank you so much for having me. It's been a well, real pleasure. Yeah, it's been an absolutely fascinating hour, hour and a bit, and I think we've overrun and I don't care. I think that was, uh, as long as you don't mind. I, I don't mind at all, and I hope I haven't been waffling, but thank you. It was such a privilege and, um, yeah, I, um, thank you so much for posting it and, and inviting me. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for doing it. And I think um, I'd just like to thank you and, and Sean, of course, who every, every month helps me so immen immensely. Uh, next month, we're going to have Lies, Damned Lies and Photography. Uh, and I've just forgotten who's giving it. Maria. Yes, Maria Falconer, sorry, FRPS is doing it. I should have put it on here. Um, uh, and again, that's one that's proving very popular early on, but uh, we'd love to see that as well. But thank you so much again, Sarah. It's, uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, and uh, you, weren't, you weren't at all nervous. You did extremely well. So thank you, you very much. I see my hands doing that under the, under the screen. But, um, <laughs> Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you to both of you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. It's been great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, TR, to me. Thank you very much. Right, so thank you. Then. Goodbye, uh, everybody. Bye. Bye now. Hello. Are we, I didn't know whether I'm going to leave meeting, but thank you, Alan. That was so, yeah, I hope it was all right. It was brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your work. Thank you. And you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.